It's the Anthony Gargano show, and this man right here, uh, I, I, dude, I love your work, Derek Bodner, Appreciate all it. PHLY. You uh, do such great work covering the Sixers. Been a long time fan of what you've done in covering Sixers in the NBA, and you've continued here. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just I love the the whole squad that we built here, uh, from Devon and Kyle, Rich, everyone that we have talking about or covering the Sixers. I think is fantastic, and there's no other team that uh, I would want to work with for sure. So you're going to go to the Allen Iverson unveiling yeah. today of that statue at one o'clock in a rain-soaked Camden. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, I don't know how it's going to work because uh, all the statues are obviously outside and that, that walk. Um, been to a couple of them now, but yeah, it's a uh, look. That's just a incredible era, uh, a incredible collection of people they will have there. I'm very excited for that. To, how did AI impact you and uh, as an NBA journalist and whole thing? Sure. Well, at that point, I had no thought of ever getting into yeah. journalism. Never thought it would be a possibility. Never really had a career path mapped out for that. Uh, I was just a huge fan. Uh, and it took what was, you know, obviously I loved basketball before then, uh, played basketball growing up. But at that point, it just became almost like an obsession. And it really was. I think about this all the time because on the one hand, it would be fascinating to see Allen Iverson play in today's NBA because there's so much more shooting. And I think that would help someone like him drive to the paint. But it's also like every, he's one of the last real, like, relatable athletes that I think we've seen come through the NBA. Everyone now feels so polished, so talked up in terms of PR. You saw the good, the bad, and the ugly with Allen Iverson every day. He wore everything on his sleeve, and it was just such a magnetic person personality to connect with. That. It's fascinating. Dude, dude, it's so fascinating because part of it is really our culture, right? Because there are a lot of characters. Yeah. Like, he was one, Philadelphia, one of the things that I always wanted to do and I never did it, um, was be a city side columnist. Okay. Because uh, of the era of the characters, yeah. like I, I'm enamored by like the like 70s and 80s. And, and I, I wrote a story or a TV series about Philadelphia in the 70s and 80s because they were and into the 90s because of all the characters yeah. that were there. And Alan was basically the last character because yeah. like yeah. part of it is <clears throat> like we always talk about you know being kind of real and he always said keeping it real and he was like he was like you said his greatness his warts everything involved like he was who he was it was unfiltered yeah no and i, I mean look certainly don't want to complain joel Embiid's a great person to cover a great team to be around but it's just so different like everyone yes. across the league is so different i have no idea how a pr staff would react to alan iverson today but from a fan perspective, like I said, the way he just showed raw emotion on a nightly basis on the court, even off the court at times, uh, it would have been fun to cover. And it was certainly a blast to watch growing up. Well, it, you know, it's interesting you bring up Joel. Joel is one of the smartest athletes mm -hmm. that I've ever encountered. Um, he's a really, really sharp. Like, yeah. and you cover yeah. him very, very smart, very intelligent. Uh, he, and he's really media savvy, which is interesting because. The whole, and he'll integrate social media, as, as you know. Like, he he's a fascinating guy because he's really, really smart and, and understands what's going on around him. He really is. And he, he comes at it from a sort of like team building perspective, too. Like, he wants to know all about the salary cap and about how to build a team. And I think that's helped Daryl Morey because I think he's had more, a little bit more patience than maybe some other superstars who just, I mean, look at what's going on with um, Milwaukee right now, yeah. the way Giannis has pushed maybe some of his leverage to get the coach that he wants and the players that he wants. It's not really working out. Joe has never really exerted that. And he's given his general managers a little bit of leeway, I think in part because he has taken the time to understand, you know, what is best for the team long-term, whereas some other superstars, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, he is, he's very smart from his social media usage to the way he was, I'm mean, just look at the way he was able to pick up basketball at 15 and become the best scorer in the world uh, over the course of a little more than a decade. It is wild. So I always, I would say that, uh, you know, art, movement is art right. there's the art of movement and joel is an art forger where i've never seen anyone that can turn the picasso of movement and whether it's a, a kobe yeah. whether it a dream elijah one yeah. and he replicates yeah. it a little bit of dirk one foot yes, step back right yeah. yeah it's so cool it's like he's got this way that and i call him the great art forger yeah no, and it's sort of a shame because I think a lot of people will look at it and, well, he's not in tip-top shape, so does he work, yada, yada, yada. No, the way to develop those skills is to put in an obscene amount of hours of yes. work. Uh, and he has a combination of athleticism and touch and fluidity and work 
to get to that point where he can master pretty much anything he has put his mind to in terms of an offensive skill set. Uh, you brought up all those different moves. He's got shades of a game, shades of Kobe, shades of Dirk, uh, and that has become one of the best scores in the history of the sport and he came into the league like you you he was a top ranked prospect because of his defensive potential yeah. to develop the way he has hasn't translated yet into playoff success and a lot of people will bring that up that is why uh the next coming weeks are so exciting you get a chance to rewrite history chance to rewrite your narrative uh, and i think that is one of the great things about the sport so take us through this weekend as uh the quest yeah. for the, the six jumbled seed. mess. Yes. Yes. So um, nobody can can decipher it like you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try not to screw it up here. Um, so if the Sixers, the Sixers right now uh, are, I believe seventh. Uh, the way to jump up to six, uh, and again, jumping up to six is really important because you avoid the play-in tournament. Uh, basically, if you're in a seven-eight seed, you play a game against those each other. Uh, if you lose that game, you play against the winner of the nine-ten seed. And if you lose that one, you're out of the playoffs. If you win that one, you're playing Boston. You want to avoid all of that. So in order to do that, you either win the seven-eight play-in game or you avoid the play-in entirely. Uh, and obviously, getting six would help with that. The way you get to six is you have to first of all have to win your last two games, um, including a big one here tonight against Orlando. And then you need either the Pacers to win both games the Pacers to lose both games or Orlando to lose their final game against the Bucks. Because really the problem is, so if it's a two team tie with the magic, you win that because you've already won both games in that matchup. You win the head to head. If it's a three team tie with the Pacers, the magic and the Sixers, then the division winner, which Orlando is gets that first tiebreaker. You go to a tiebreaker with the Pacers. You lose that tiebreaker because you've lost two out of three games against the Pacers. So you have to avoid that three team tie. The way you do that, like I said, First of all, win your first two games. That's a prerequisite for all of it. Uh, and then you have to either have the Pacers win both games or lose both games. Now, they got Cleveland and Atlanta. And Atlanta. Yep. Um, because that would avoid the Pacers tying with the Sixers and yeah. the Magic or to have Magic lose their final game against the Bucs. Um, and that's, the Bucks are going to be interesting because right now they are, I think, a game up on the Knicks. So if they win their next game, I think that's tonight against Oklahoma City. If they win that next game, then the final game won't matter. They probably won't play anyone. Damn, will rest. It'll give Orlando a real easy win. So you got to hope that the Bucks lose tonight, uh, so they have something to play for in the finale. Wow. All right. So, what, seeing how this thing is developed, watching how would Joel looked 36 minutes last game, yeah. like that was important, the number of minutes. Seeing how this team is really interesting because yep. Maxi as the co star, not Simmons or Harden, both who had warts, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to energy, and then all these role players. How are you feeling about a run? I think this this team probably is built around Joel Embiid better, just in terms of matching skill sets than anyone than any team that he has had. It might not be the highest talent level. You could go back to 2019 when he had Jimmy and yeah. JJ and Tobias. But he was that. himself. He, he was not he as now. good back then. Right. Absolutely, uh, and he struggled a lot uh, offensively in that playoff series. But and there's other teams like Harden you mix in. They might have higher talent levels, but I think Maxi is the best co-star he has had in terms of fitting his skill sets being able to play off of his strengths i'm really interested to see what tyrese maxi does as the undisputed top perimeter scorer on this team um because i think he has abilities that his i mean look ben simmons and, and joel Embiid were a real tough fit a real tough fit james harden at that stage of his career yeah he might give you a game or two but he did not have the burst to carry you through a seven game series we saw that towards the end maxi with the way he has deep range uh, the way he's able to get in the paint he just has so many different ways to attack you and it's so tough to game plan against that pick and roll between those two or that dribble handoff whatever they run i'm really interested i'm really really interested the question is going to come down to do they have enough perimeter defense i worry about that a little bit a lot of the guards they have aren't necessarily strong uh yeah. defenders but i think they have you know if their shots are going in and that's always a, a huge key and that can swing a playoff series and even the best shooting teams can struggle over seven games even the worst shooting teams i mean miami the other year Going on that run uh, was largely driven by their three-point shooting. They were a bad three-point shooting team. So there's a lot of variance, but I think they are set up where they have a real good team around Joel Embiid. The question is, can Joel Embiid last the entire playoffs? And also, like, their path is tough because they fall into the 6-7. They might have to end up beating, you know, the Bucks in the first round, the Knicks in the second round, and then the Celtics in the conference finals. Yeah. That's a real yeah. tough path. Uh, so I think they're set up pretty well. I think Joel Embiid looks pretty fresh. He's probably about as good as you could have expected coming back from that layoff. But... A lot of stuff still has to go right. Yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I know you laid it out perfectly. You know what's interesting? One, one last thing. Kelly Oubre is an interesting role mm -hmm. player because I was talking about this with Legs. He almost he gives you what Tobias gives you in the sense that 
he's and he's fearless, right? Like he's the one thing about yep. Tobias is a more polished game, yep. but Ubre's fearless, right? And Ubre will shoot the ball, and Ubre will try to score, and that's an interesting component that he brings. Yeah, he's. I think Ubre is fascinating because he is crucially important, and throughout his career, he's been very flawed. Like his shooting, yeah. low sh- low thirties th- shooting from three, he struggled to consistently make shots. A lot of that has come down to his shot selection. Uh, last year, I remember with open catch and shoot threes, he was shooting like thirty seven percent from three. When he took a contested three, it dropped to like 25%. So it's a lot getting him to shoot the good shots and pass away the bad shots. He's had more turnovers and assists for his career. But over the last month, two months, he's played much better basketball. He's been a much more willing distributor. Uh, and I think the shot selection has been there. Uh, so far this year, while he's playing alongside Joel Embiid, his three-point percentage is up around a 38% mark. And if that combined with the passing continues, uh, and I think there's reason that you would say, yeah, he will shoot better with Joe because Joe attracts so much attention. If that continues... He can become a real key piece for them. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. All right, next week we're going to get crazy here. All right, Derek, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll be uh, watching you, reading you, and the, uh, of course, Allen Iverson statue unveiling, yeah. and then the, the game tonight. So great stuff, brother. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.